On July 12, 2016, the Philippines won, in Philippines vs. China, an arbitration which it filed before a tribunal in The Hague, the Netherlands, under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas, or UNCLOS. The case was over claims filed by the Philippines seeking clarification on the status of some maritime features in the South China Sea. It is considered the landmark case by most authorities and academics in the field of international law. China refused to participate in the arbitration, and up to today, continues to deny the award. Seven years after the ruling, China continues to violate the rights of the Philippines in the South China Sea. This includes harassing Filipino fisherfolk at Scarborough Shoal and the provisioning of Philippine military personnel at Ayungan Shoal. This documentary will discuss the victory of the Philippines in the South China Sea arbitration its origins, the events that led then-President Benigno Aquino III to authorize its filing, the government functionaries who implemented President Aquino's decision, and the challenges they met. It explains the award and the challenges in enforcing it. In making this documentary, government source materials, primary sources, the proceedings before The Hague, published and unpublished reports, and the like, were thoroughly examined. This also includes access to the papers of former Supreme Court Justice Francis Hardeleza, who was then the Solicitor General of the Philippines when the case was filed, and thus acted as Chief Legal Advisor to the government until his elevation to the Supreme Court in 2014. Research and preparation for this episode took months to make its publication in time for the 7th anniversary of the award. Recent events have made this piece more interesting. We are airing it right when the issue on its enforcement is gaining the spotlight once again. There is a growing discussion on whether to file a new arbitration case in The Hague, to pursue a continuation of the UNCLOS case, or make a new one under the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea or ITLAS in Germany, to refer the matter to the General Assembly of the United Nations, or to continue diplomatic negotiations with China. This makes this documentary relevant and timely. The South China Sea is a semi-enclosed sea located on the western edge of the Pacific Ocean, covering over 3.5 million square kilometers and is abutted by the coasts of seven states. There are hundreds of tiny islets, rocks, and reefs located in the South China Sea. As a strategic international waterway, an estimated three to five billions of dollars worth of trade passes through it each year. The area is reputed to be rich in oil and gas deposits. Many states abutting the South China Sea have occupied certain features located in the area. The situation was aggravated in 2009 when China introduced its so-called Nine Dash Line, which encompasses 2 million kilometers, more than 60% of the totality of the South China Sea. Prior to its filing of the arbitral claim in 2013, the Philippines had engaged China in 17 years of diplomatic protests over conflicting claims over features occupied by the Philippines in the South China Sea. The boiling point was reached in 2012, early in the administration of President Aquino, when the Scarborough standoff occurred. This was precipitated by the Chinese barricading the mouth of Scarborough Shoal with its Coast Guard vessels as an offshoot of apprehensions by Philippine Coast Guards of Chinese poachers. Traditionally, Filipinos fished within the shoal. Francis Arduleza was then the Solicitor General. Within weeks after I was appointed Solicitor General in 2012, then Executive uh, Secretary uh, Paquito Jojo Ochoa Jr. summoned me to Malacanang and uh, he gave me my marching orders. He told me to work very closely with the office of the President under him the Department of Foreign Affairs under Secretary Albert del Rosario, 
and the Department of Energy, the Department of Justice. We were to study the options available to President Aquino in responding to the Scarborough Shoal crisis. At that time, there, there were a number of options available. There was a conciliation. We can continue with more diplomatic engagement with China, or we can go appeal to an international body like ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or the United Nations, or we can file a case before an international court or an international tribunal. We first completed uh, forming our advisory panel of international law experts, which included uh, partners from two American law firms. One advice stood out. I clearly remember. This was the advice of Professor W. Michael Riesman of Yale Law School. He advised us to this effect. Go for compulsory arbitration under the UNCLOS or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. He advised strongly, do not go for conciliation. Then Professor Riesman predicted that the tribunal may split the hearing into two phases, a jurisdictional phase and a merits phase. He estimated our chances of winning on jurisdiction to be 50-50 or even. But if ever we get into the merits, he predicted that our chances will go up to around 80%. He nevertheless cautioned that if the Philippines should lose on the issue of jurisdiction, the result may be devastating. In due course, the security cluster of the cabinet unanimously chose the firm of Foley and Howard, headed by Paul Reichler, to be our lead counsel. Reichler is famous among lawyers for having won for Nicaragua, an arbitration against the United States filed before the International Court of Justice. Foley and Howag agreed to be our counsel on my insistence on a fixed fee basis, assuring us of a limit on attorney's fees. The Philippine team held several meetings with the advisory groups in Washington, D.C. and New York and later Paul Reichler and his team made numerous fact-finding trips to Manila. The Philippine team, including Reichler, agreed that the case against China aimed to secure declarations from the tribunal constituted under UNCLOS concerned three specific matters. That China is not entitled to exercise historic rights over the waters, seabed, and subsoil beyond the limits set under UNCLOS in the areas within its so-called Nine Dash Line. That maritime features relied on by China to assert its claims to the South China Sea are not islands that generate an exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, or continental shelf, but are rocks. Under the UNCLOS, these are low tide elevations or submerged banks incapable of generating such entitlements that China has interfered with the exercise of the Philippines' sovereign rights and freedoms under UNCLOS and international law. These issues solely concern the interpretation or application of UNCLOS, 
regarding matters that China is not opted out of under the same UNCLOS provisions. Sometime in December 2012, President Aquino instructed the Philippine team to go to Washington, D.C. and make final arrangements on the filing of the arbitration. They immediately went to Washington, D.C. and completed the final drafts. On January 17, 2013, Secretary Ochoa sent a final memo to President Aquino saying that the whole team recommended the filing of the arbitration. On January 22, 2013, President Aquino convened the National Security Council and the leaders of Congress and got approval. On the same day, then Solicitor General Francis Hardeleza signed, as agent, the statement and notification of claim. The Philippines thus crossed its Rubicon on the South China Sea. Well, to, to me, one of the most important things to remember about the arbitration is that it was a sole executive decision of President Aquino. As you know, the President of the Philippines is the chief architect of Philippine foreign policy. All of us government officials who were involved in the preparation or the filing of the case were mere functionaries of the president. But, and I keep stressing, it was President Aquino who took on the heavy burden of deciding with all its attendant risks in case of failure whether or not to proceed with the arbitration. I hope our historians will soon take time to write a fully documented account of how President Aquino arrived at his decision. With the demand for arbitration filed and with Foley and Hogue on board, preparations went into high gear. The Philippines nominated the first member of the five-member tribunal. Then China communicated its refusal to participate, which prompted the president of the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea to complete its members. China's non-participation was of no moment, however. Under the compulsory arbitration rules of UNCLOS, the tribunal can proceed to hear the case, provided that it has jurisdiction over the dispute and that the claim is backed by facts and law. Meanwhile, the original notification and statement of claim covered seven features located in the South China Sea. At that time, Foley and Hogue thought it inadvisable to seek determination of the status of each one of the hundreds of disputed maritime features. However, since then, the thinking of the Philippine team evolved and they saw the need to include six new features, to make for a total of 13. Thus, in December 2013, the Philippines filed its notification and amended statement of claim. The tribunal then gave the Philippines a period of up to March 30, 2014, to file its written memorial, the equivalent of a memorandum or brief in an ordinary litigation. Preparations for the filing of the memorial went into high gear, an iterative process marked by Foley and Hogue preparing the first drafts, followed by comments and markups from Philippine councils. The Philippines hired English barristers, cartographers, historians, and other professionals to help out. On March 30, 2014, the Philippines submitted its memorial. It was a 272-page document supported by 10 volumes of maps, nautical charts, arbitral documents, Philippine and Chinese government documents, ASEAN documents, academic articles, legal authorities, and more. Expectedly, China did not submit a memorial. Instead, it published a position paper in December 2014 arguing that the tribunal lacks jurisdiction. 
Then the tribunal bifurcated the arbitration. It split into two phases. It decided to first hear and decide the question of jurisdiction. If the Philippines loses on jurisdiction, the case would be dismissed. Only if the tribunal decides to take on the case would it hear and decide the Philippines' claims on their merits. The tribunal held a hearing on jurisdiction and admissibility in The Hague in July 2015 and rendered an award on jurisdiction and admissibility on October 29, 2015. It decided some issues on jurisdiction, deferring others for further consideration. It then convened a hearing on the merits from November 24 to 30, 2015. The Philippines won the first round. Our team had to make many decisions on strategy and tactics. And uh, towards the deadline for the filing of the memorial, there developed a major point of disagreement among the members of the team whether or not to include in our memorial around uh, 28 paragraphs discussing Ito Aba. What is Ito Aba? Ito Aba is a maritime feature located strategically near Palawan and the Reed Bank. It is currently occupied by Taiwan. While one group among us wanted to include these 28 paragraphs on Ito Aba, another group objected on the ground that if we do so, we ran the risk of the tribunal throwing out our case on the ground that we were uh, amending our claim. We elevated this impasse to President Aquino, who decided to include the 28 paragraphs on Ito Aba. Initially, we objected to the uh, proposal of the tribunal to bifurcate the proceedings. It would add to our costs. We felt that our case on jurisdiction would be stronger if it were heard together with our case on the merits, you know, considering that we had these maps and other documentary evidence. Ultimately, however, the tribunal decided to split the proceedings. So we, we just merely redoubled our efforts. We had a full Filipino delegation for the first hearing on jurisdiction. Cabinet Secretaries uh, Ochoa, Del Rosario, De Lima, and Kagiwa were present with Speaker Feliciano Belmonte Jr. of the House of Representatives. Also present during the hearings were Solicitor General uh, Florin Hilbay, who succeeded me in 2014. Then there was Senior Executive Secretary and now Solicitor General Minardo Guevara. There was also then uh, Political Advisor on uh, Political Affairs, uh, Ronald Liamas. And of course, we had uh, with us, we were very lucky to have with us, General uh, Rodolfo Biason, who was then a member of the House of Representatives. The hearings were held at the historic Peace Palace located at the Hague, Netherlands. What I found eerie about the proceedings was the space reserved for the Chinese councils and their representatives. Given their position on the proceedings, their seats remained unoccupied until the end. After the filing of the memorial, we found out to select venues 
as recommended and arranged by Reichler, our lead counsel. This time to plead our case in the court of public opinion. I explained our cause before. Number one, the uh, Council of Foreign Relations, a 100-year-old premier think tank for international relations based in New York City. I also had a speaking engagement before the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. We also hit the leading American law schools. We went to Harvard Law School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, New York University School of Law in New York City, among others. Of course, I continued to speak for our claim even after I was elevated to the uh, Supreme Court. Many other Filipinos took on the same role in the public discourse that followed the filing of our arbitration. For, for example, in 2015, Professor Harry Roque, uh, then uh, professor at the UP College of Law, invited me to be the keynote speaker at a symposium on the South China Sea, sponsored by the Harvard International Law Association in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, in that, in that uh, symposium, Professor Rocky squared off with Professor Talmon, a German professor who authored a, uh, what I would say, a very pro-China book on the South China Sea issue. Prior to this, Professor Roque also publicly jousted with Sui Han Kim, a Chinese academic and jurist at the International Court of Justice, also over our South China Sea claim. On July 12, 2016, after the term of President Aquino had ended and the term of President Rodrigo Duterte had begun, the tribunal rendered its award. It was a sweeping and complete victory for the Philippines. The award's main holdings are as follows that the tribunal has jurisdiction to consider the dispute, that any historic claim of China to historic rights to resources in the waters of the South China Sea were extinguished because they became incompatible with the exclusive economic zones provided by UNCLOS, that there is no legal basis for China to claim historic rights to resources within the sea area falling within the Nine-Dash Line, that of the features located in the South China Sea, the tribunal held that features above water at high tide generate an entitlement to at least a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. Features submerged at high tide do not have territorial sea. And islands generate an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles. Thus, the tribunal determined which of the features disputed are rocks, islands, or low-tide elevation reefs. Accordingly, the tribunal held that none of the Spratly Islands can generate maritime economic zones collectively as a unit. None of the features claimed by China is capable of generating an exclusive economic zone. It could, without delimiting a boundary, declare that certain sea areas are within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines, because those areas are not overlapped by any entitlement of China. 
that fishermen from the Philippines, like those from China, have traditional fishing rights at Scarborough Shoal. That from the finding that certain areas are within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines, China had violated the Philippines' rights by interfering with Philippine fishing and petroleum exploration, constructing artificial islands, and failing to prevent Chinese fishermen from fishing in the zone. Lastly, the China's large-scale land reclamation and construction of artificial islands harmed the environment. In short, the tribunal gave a verdict with the Philippines winning almost all of the points in its claim. What does this mean for the Philippines? First, since Scarborough Shoal were held to be near rocks, which generate at most only a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. This means that China, which had barricaded the mouth of the shoal, can legally control only at most only the 12 mile territorial sea surrounding the shoal. Considering, however, that the tribunal recognized that China and the Philippines both have traditional fishing rights in and around the shoal, Filipinos can legally fish within the 12 nautical miles around Scarborough Shoal. Note though, that while the tribunal did not declare which country uh, owns the shoal as the International Court of Justice has the sole jurisdiction over a dispute on ownership of a territory. Second, this means that China cannot legally interdict the provisioning of military personnel stationed on the naval vessel grounded in Ayungin Shoal, which was found to be within the Philippines' 200-mile exclusive economic zone with no overlapping claim with China. Third, this means that China has no right over the fish and the non-living resources contained in the reed bank because Ito Aba, occupied by Taiwan, is but a rock and thus does not generate a 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zone that can possibly overlap with Palawan, or the Reed Bank. Fourth, this means that all the nautical area comprising what the Philippines calls the West Philippine Sea, which is but a portion of the vaster South China Sea, save possibly for the 12 nautical miles uh, donut around Scarborough Shoal, all belong to the Philippines. In other words, under the terms of the UNCLOS, only the Philippines can fish in these waters and exploit its non-fish natural resources like oil and gas. Finally, this means that while sovereign countries like China have the so-called uh, right of innocent passage for its vessels to pass through our seas. This does not include any right to swarm our seas with stationary Chinese coast guard or militia vessels.
The arbitral tribunal rendered the award on July 12, 2016, seven full years ago, into the term of President Rodrigo Duterte, who affirmed the award before the United Nations, no less. And the 2016 arbitral award. The Philippines is now under the term of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Why then do the same issues that surrounded the Scarborough Shoal standoffs seem to be still around? Why do the Chinese continue to prevent Filipino fishermen from fishing within Philippine waters, especially around Scarborough Shoal? How can their Coast Guard vessels continue to prevent Filipino fisherfolks from entering the shoal? Why do Chinese Coast Guard and militia vessels continue to harass and swarms Filipino fishermen and try to prevent the provisioning of Philippine Armed Forces outposts at the Yungin Shoal? Why does China continue to insist on being a partner to the Philippine exploration for and subsequent development of our possible oil gas deposits in the West Philippine Sea? The short answer is that there will always be a, a problem of enforcement because there is no international sheriff or policeman who can enforce the decision of the arbitral tribunal. This is especially significant in this case because China has consistently refused to acknowledge the power of the tribunal to hear the case in the first place. Now, you ask me, was President Aquino aware of this possible limitation? Yes. Executive Secretary Ochoa, then Presidential Legal Advisor, now Supreme Court Justice Kagiwa, and I personally explained to him this possible outcome. Given the costs of arbitration and the political risks involved, President Aquino expectedly asked me, why should we bother going to arbitration if we would not be able to enforce a favorable decision? My view, consistent with many other knowledgeable commentators and teachers of, of international law, was that a carefully crafted case may result in an arbitral award which will give uh, clarity to the many issues of first impression that we raised. Enforcement would be for a later case or other forms of redress. As noted at the start of this documentary, there are at the moment contrasting proposals being presented to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on how to enforce the tribunal award. One is to go to the United Nations and the other is to continue with another arbitration, a follow-up case. Very recently, an ambassador suggested the filing of a case with the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or the ITLAS, in Germany. If we go to the United Nations, we have to contend with the veto power of China in the United Nations Security Council. While we can go before the General Assembly of the UN to debate China's action, and possibly get majority support or a majority vote, this would still not be binding as far as China is concerned. Therefore, I submit that under all the circumstances, another case before another ad hoc tribunal 
constituted under the UNCLOS or perhaps under the ITLOS, but this time managed and argued solely by the Office of the Solicitor General of the Philippines without the heavy cost of hiring foreign counsel and maybe uh, coupled with uh, recourse to the Convention on the uh, uh, Foreign Recognition of Foreign Judgments in the Philippines or abroad or a combination of this uh, uh, essentially litigation options would be the better way for the country. The OSG can choose from a menu of possible claims, including, for example, a claim for damages or other provisional reliefs. The advantage of a case or an, or an arbitration is it can be commenced and finished within about ultimately around three years. Of course, we all have to remember that ultimately the decision of how best to proceed or not to proceed will reside solely with our beloved president as the chief architect of our foreign policy. It is my hope, however, that on the seventh anniversary of our historic win, we pause and consider the lessons of our victory and be guided as we engage in spirited debate on how best to achieve the same patriotic goal. Let us all be heard so that our president can make the right decision. Seven years ago, the Philippines marked a significant victory in international law, challenging China's maritime claims in the South China Sea. Yet, despite the resounding victory in The Hague, an unyielding China continues to assert its presence, disrupting the lives of Filipino fisherfolks and military personnel in the contested waters. As the enforcement of the arbitration issue resurfaces, the Philippines finds itself in another crucial juncture, prompting debates on the best course of action moving forward. This documentary is not just a recounting of past events, but a timely reminder of the stakes involved and the importance of the decision stakeholders make today. The South China Sea, with its strategic importance and rich resources, remains a contested territory, and the Philippines' journey towards asserting its rightful claim is far from over. In the end, the path the country chooses whether it be further arbitration, diplomatic negotiations, or taking the matter to the United Nations General Assembly, rests in the hands of its leaders. But let us not forget, the Filipino people also have a voice in this discourse. This is more than just a story of an arbitration case. This is a testament to the resilience, determination, and courage of the Filipino people carrying these qualities forward as they navigate the uncertain waters of the future.